Originally, someone else wanted to do this introduction of our next awesome keynote speaker, but just a few seconds ago, I decided I want to do it myself because for me this is quite special because our next keynote speaker is Max, Max Schrems, really personal hero of mine for many, many years and also should be your hero, by the way, um, because he is really defending our privacy rights in, um, here in Europe in a big way. Um, had the guts to sue like Facebook two times and won two times against it. So this is uh, obviously quite cool and quite an achievement. It also, I have to say, is always for me always a bit weird to, to see that because, I mean, we have in Europe, we have some privacy laws, we have the GDPR, we have other regulations. But somehow, like a single person, like a law student is needed somehow to enforce our, our rights here because no one else, no other organization did it at the time. So I'm really happy that uh, Max did that and obviously because we're going into the third round now, keeps on fighting um, for that to protect our data um, also as part of his organization, uh, None of Your Business, which I think is super cool and deserves some support from all of us. So I'm personally really, really happy to have Max here. So say a big welcome to Max now. Um, thanks a lot for the introduction and um, on the supporting part of all of this, you guys already support us because we're running on Nextcloud ourselves, so um, that's not the reason I'm usually not like promoting, but thanks. Um, um, get, exactly. Um, I was, uh, can you turn me a little bit down if possible? It's a bit much, at least from my perspective, I hope it's not. Um, yeah, I was asked to talk about the EU-US data transfers, um, a very lengthy story. Um, I am gonna, just going to start up with a recap of what happened, what's the background story, why we ended up with this whole endless discussion, um, and in the end go into this new data transfer deal that was um, announced this summer. Uh, we just realized, actually, the keynote here was um, announced like the after the passing, I think, of the new law. We just realized yesterday it wasn't technically passed yet because the EU has put it on its website, but not in the official journal of the EU, and that's not how law is passed. So it seems actually this thing doesn't even exist yet. So I was writing with someone on the commission on uh, yesterday, and they said, yeah, actually, we still have to publish it officially. So um, seems companies are already transferring stuff under a law that is not officially passed yet. Um, that's kind of the state of play. And uh, back to the intro of, yes, we have the GDPR. Yes, we have all these wonderful laws. Uh, but we have a huge enforcement gap. So a lot of that is just on paper. And in reality, if you don't follow it, not much happens. Um, so basically, um, going into the data transfer discussion, um, first, I would like to explain in a very, very simplified version how U.S. surveillance law works. Uh, because we oftentimes talk, oh, there's some law, there's something going on. Um, but to probably dive a little bit deeper into that and how that um, actually works. Um, this um, is actually a slide from, from Berlin um, where the um, um, Snowden disclosures happened. And when we had all these demonstrations, um, that's tw almost 10 years ago, more than 10 years ago. Um, and the big discussion was, what are we going to do? There was outrage. Merkel was unhappy that her phone was tapped and, and all that kind of drama. But actually, there was not much that would have happened. Um, so we started with discussions on, on how we can litigate that. And actually, a, a journalist called me one night and asked me, is that actually legal from a privacy perspective, like for these companies to actually just give all that data to the American services? And I was like, Usually journalists, you have the same questions all over it again and you answer them again. This time I was like, that's a really interesting question because I haven't really thought about that. And if you look at it, you have basically two surveillance systems. The one is called Upstream, which is capturing the data on the backbone of the internet. Um, that becomes less and less relevant because more and more of that data is encrypted. So they can see where the data comes from, where it goes to, to a certain level, but below the encryption level, not that much anymore. The second thing that they came up with was back then called PRISM. Now it's called Downstream. These two things are the same. They just changed the name over the time. And the idea here is let's get the data from the service providers because they have the keys, they have access to the data, they have to be able to process it. So there is some way that they can get it. And we just required them to give us all the information. 
which is obviously the easiest and most convenient way for a secret service. I usually joke is like it used to be that they have to tap each phone. Now they just have to tap basically Apple and Google and thereby have almost every phone, um, which is much more convenient for a secret service than, than doing it themselves. As you can see from the slides, they were already pretty dated when they were published by Snowden. The, and that's more than 10 years ago. So we do know some stuff that went down 10 years ago, but we all know how much technology has changed since then. So it's not unlikely that much more is happening, that there is new security services, new um, um, operations that happen that we're simply not aware of. Um, so oftentimes we talk about these two programs, but we have to think that there is a law in the background that allows these programs. They could be totally different programs by now. There is no official recognition. There is no official reason to, to say there is definitely something new, or maybe they've just developed further. Um, but just to kind of think about that for a second, that this is the status of probably 15 years ago, um, and there may be much more by now. Um, in these slides, it was rather interesting because you also have the different um, levels that, um, of, of systems that talk to each other, where, I don't know, they say some voice component goes over into this system and so on. It's not very detailed, but basically there's an FBI direct interception unit that does um, kind of the technical connection as far as we know, and then the different services can provide, uh, the different services can get the data through them. So basically that's, that is kind of the NSA bubble of, of what they do. What's really interesting is we also had the logos of the different companies on it. And there's a slide that also says when, which company was actually hooked up to the system on which date. Um, so we had a very good understanding of how this works and that's, crucial for surveillance litigation because usually surveillance litigation is a big ass conspiracy theory. You just don't know in detail what they do. It's all secret. As a lawyer, you look like a fool if you're in front of the judge and say, oh, they may do and uh. And in this case, we actually had a bit of an understanding what they really do. If you look at American law, um, all of that happens under Pfizer 702. Um, that has a second um, kind of number in US law, which is 50 US code 1881A. So you sometimes see 1881A or FISA 702 in, in reporting. It's basically the same law. That law is 14 pages long. And even though I'm, people say I'm not the worst lawyer the world has ever seen, it takes you days to understand how these articles interrelate to each other. It's the most fucked up law the world has ever seen. But once you go through it, you realize that there's a lot of like just back and forth blinking that doesn't make any sense. Um, if you look at the, at the gist of the law, what it really says, you have two elements that you need. You need an electronic communication service provider, which is a cloud provider, basically telco provider, anything like that. What's important is this law does not apply to any US business, only to these electronic communication service providers. So if you send data, let's say, to Lufthansa um, US subsidiary, something like that, they would probably not be an electronic communication service provider and wouldn't fall under law. So it's not like any data that goes to the US is the end of the world. It's specifically kind of the big cloud providers where they actually really fall under these laws. The second thing you need is foreign intelligence information. And that is defined as information that relates to the conduct of the foreign affairs of the United States. There's additional, um, that's kind of the broadest definition. There's a couple of um, things that fall under that definition. Long story short, this is an extremely broad definition. That basically means anything we're interested in globally. That's the kind of plain language. Um, and that's the two things. You need um, this electronic communication service provider and foreign, foreign intelligence information. You do not need a crime. You do not need probable cause. You do not need an individual person you go after. Um, you don't need any of these elements we typically have in criminal law or in phone tapping laws, in, in these laws that we have. The interesting thing is this would actually be illegal in the US as well under the Fourth Amendment. Um, the Fourth Amendment also says, very similar to Europe, that you need probable cause to phone tap and you need a judge saying yes. In very, again, simplified terms, but uh, for the purposes of, of, of here, that's kind of what you want. The problem with the Fourth Amendment is the Fourth Amendment only applies to American citizens or U.S. persons, so also permanent residents. Um, and that is historically normal, like we had that in the U.S. as well, that we had citizens' rights mainly because, you know, 200 years ago, people didn't move much, so you were usually the citizen of the country that you were in, so you had citizens' rights. Now, ever since the Second World War, the latest, we usually have human rights now because we realized it's very easy to just say, you're not a citizen, you don't have any rights. Um, so we moved into human rights. The US is still under the old constitutional fabric that they have in the idea of citizens' rights. Now, what this law does is basically these elements here, the minimization and targeting procedures, separate the data stream into American data and non-American data. 
that's fundamentally what this law does. It's kind of a switch that says, okay, this bit is related to an American person, can't touch it because it would be unconstitutional, very bad. This bit is not related to an American person, you can go and do whatever you want to do. And that is structurally what this law does. Um, they call that minimization and targeting procedures, and that's kind of these filter procedures. Now, the US says that that's all approved by the FISA court, and that sounds like, oh, there's judicial review. Some court is actually looking at that. What the court is looking at is the entire surveillance system for one year. So it certifies basically the filtering. It doesn't certify the individual data bit that goes through it and if there is actually probable cause or reason to look at it. So it's basically the system that gets approved by the court, not as usual that you say, okay, there's really that guy that really has some reason that's connected to, I don't know, IS or whatever. Um, and that is kind of the interesting thing that there is court approval, but not individualized court approval. Um, and that usually makes it rather useless for, for most of the purposes. Who is actually making the individual targeting procedure is an, is an NSA officer. They have a targeting sheet, which is basically a form where they can put in an identifier. Identifier is typically an IP address, um, email address, any kind of like user ID for social network, stuff like that. Um, and they can type it in. They need to kind of put one box where they say why they do that click the button and that targets the person and the data. Um, we have the numbers for the big providers, so we talk about a couple of hundred thousand accounts per um, half a year um, that are targeted. And one account may include the data of hundreds of people because if it's the email address of one person, you have all the emails that go to that person from other people as well. Um, so the numbers are actually quite vast if you think about it. Um, then there is a so-called directive to the service provider, which is the legal order saying you have to kind of give us access to the data. Um, then we don't know the details of how that's done, but technically it has to be something like an API where they can basically call the data and get it back. Um, they say, oh, we don't say how it's technically actually implemented. The law only says you have to kind of do the technical implementation to be able to capture the data. Um, but we, in litigation, we asked people that had these security clearances if they're sending letters back and forth between the Silicon Valley and, and, and the NSA headquarters. And that's for voice over IP, not overly likely that that's how it's done. Um, so we do assume that there is some kind of API where you can get the data from. So um, litigation-wise, basically the system was like that. If I'm that little Austrian smiley down here, um, I had a contract with Facebook Ireland back then. We started all of this um, for the younger people in the audience, like. 12, 13 years ago, Facebook was cool back then, people actually used it. Um, but you have exactly the same thing with, uh, uh, with Instagram now and, and, and the likes. Um, so you have a contract with ac actually Facebook Ireland, which is a European Irish company. And this Irish company then sends the data abroad to the US. Um, and they have a contract with each other and have to um, make sure that the data is properly um, kind of protected in the US, otherwise they're not allowed to send the data outside of the EU. Now, they can't really do that because if your data de facto goes on a US server, it's going to be surveilled under 12333, which is an executive order, uh, another law that I'm not going to go into, through upstream. And then under FISA, you basically get the data back out of through PRISM and have it somehow end up at the NSA. So it's very hard for them to kind of write into a contract that this does not happen because that's simply US law. Now, if you um, think about why they're so interested in, in especially um, uh, PRISM or their downstream, as they call it, that is basically one of the slides where they say, that's where there is no SSL encryption anymore. Yoo-hoo, we can get the data right there because they have the encryption keys. And that is also interesting because a lot of the um, American companies said, oh, we're just going to have encryption. We're going to solve all the problems. Um, and they have endless lists of how their data is now secured. If you look at it, they always just basically talk about the transport part of it and not when it's actually there. Um, even Google said, yeah, there is, I've, I'm not the tech person, but the A something encryption on their service was like, Great, that's the same thing that my Android phone has, but if you have the code. <laughs> and, um, so they try to kind of uh, oftentimes come up with, kind of, oh, there's encryption. And most of the lawyers just hear encryption are like, cool, encryption, but don't talk where, when, where does it actually um, protect anybody. Now, if you look at the other side, at the EU side of the story, um, we basically, and most people ignored that ever since, since 1995, when the first directive came around, we had an export prohibition on data. So basically, the EU says you cannot export data out of the European economic area, period, as a, as a default rule. Why is that? If you have privacy rules and you just 
send the data to the next country that doesn't have the privacy rules and they're fair game, then your whole system doesn't make any sense because you can just move your data out of the protected area or out of the jurisdiction. Now, there is a derogation for what I would call necessary transfers. So if you have to book a hotel in North Korea, you are absolutely fine in booking hotels in North Korea because it's really necessary to send your booking to Pyongyang if you really want to stay there. Obviously, North Korea is probably the country that has the least protections of anything that we can think of, but that's fine. The GDPR accepts if you really want to go there, you have to book your hotel, that's fine. Um, what's the bigger issue is the outsourcing part. So if you don't really need to send data abroad, but it's more convenient, cheaper, the business is there, whatever happens. And for that, there are different options to kind of extend GDPR rules to another country. Um, how that works is if you think about Switzerland, it has a Data Protection Act and we kind of accept that that Data Protection Act is very similar to the European Union and that becomes like a big privacy bubble and we say, oh, you can just send the data there because Swiss law is very similar to the EU law. Swiss people may disagree, um, but that's kind of the fundamental idea. Now, if you have a country like the US where there's no Data Protection Act, that can also work. You can contractually kind of get there. It's a bit like if you say I buy organic bananas from some country and they just follow the rules of what organic is in the EU. We kind of say, okay, you're not from an EU country, but what you do is still kind of compliant with our rules. So we accept it and you can put the bananas in the supermarket. Woohoo. That's kind of what we do with so-called um, standard contractual clauses. So that's a contract privacy shield by binding corporate rules and so on. What this basically does is that an American company signs a contract saying I follow EU law. And therefore, they're kind of our data is protected contractually. That can work. Sounds um, like a bit technical, but it's from a legal perspective fine. If there is a vacuum in another country, if the other country just has no rules, then you can have a contract over what you're going to do. The problem with the US is they have these surveillance laws. And you cannot contract out of them. So basically, you have a situation where all these contractual arrangements that all these companies are now pushing and where there's all kind of endless paperwork to sign are going to conflict with American law. Because if this contract or EU law says you need to have privacy and American law says you have to have surveillance, at some point this is not going to work out. Um, fundamentally, from a lawyer's perspective, it's like two trains colliding. There's too much law, two laws saying the opposite thing. You can technically not comply with both at the same time. Um, and what the EU is trying to is to put more text or more paper in between the two colliding, colliding trains and we can all figure out what happens with the paper, it's going to be shredded. Um, and that happened at the Court of Justice twice. So it's uh, like not too hard to comprehend that if two laws simply or two jurisdictions simply say the opposite thing, you cannot contract out of it. Like there, there is no way. Um, and that is fundamentally what we're doing now since 10 years is to explain that to the European Commission and failing over and over again. Um, how did that happen? So we ended up at the Court of Justice. The Court of Justice is kind of the Supreme Court of the European Union, the highest court we have. Um, and the case law was kind of interesting because typically when you have fundamental rights, um, we have a so-called proportionality test. So they say, okay, there's a fundamental right, the right to privacy, for example, and then there's a public interest. Let's say going against criminals is a public interest and you have to balance these two interests somehow. And we do that in a so-called proportionality test, which is a four-step test that you go through. The first three steps kind of make sense. The fourth step is kind of like a political, ah, how far did that go? Um, so that's typically where we are. And then there is a situation, for example, for, for um, data retention that the member states do over and over again, where your cell phone metadata is kept for terrorist prevention, um, which is the whole data retention Vorratsdatenspeicherungs discussion. We usually ended up in the red zone and the Court of Justice said, no, you can't do that bit too much. Now, what exists on top of that, and that's legal geekism, um, there is a violation of the essence of your fundamental right. Never happens. It's basically if a violation is so massive that they don't even start the proportionality test anymore. The only time that exists by law is um, in torture. There is no proportionate torture. It's just always banned. Um, and what was interesting in both of these types of litigation, the Court of Justice actually said that the, uh, that the surveillance in the US is so extreme that it's a violation of the essence of fundamental rights. They said, we're not even starting a proportionality test here anymore. This is so outside. We're not even going to engage in this discussion. And that is very bold from the Court of Justice. There is no other judgments other than these two where they have found that so far. So the court is actually quite strong on that. Uh, for us, it was interesting because we, we argued the violation of the essence when we're there, because the case law basically suggested that. We never thought the Court of Justice would actually say it. So you sit there in Luxembourg, get the judgment. You kind of divide it up by the lawyers. Everybody reads a couple of pages. And our Irish 
Irish lawyer was like, oh my god, they, we found a violation of the essence, which is, as a lawyer, like, woo, we found something super crazy, because it never existed in case law before. Um, and we didn't think ourselves that they would say that, but they did. Um, so what, in the end, we now ha need to have is that you have to, um, if you transfer data abroad, you have to have essential equivalence with the GDPR, so you have to make sure that the company abroad kind of follows the same rules, it doesn't have to be exactly the same, and you have to follow the Charter of Fundamental Rights, which is kind of the fundamental rights uh, document in the European Union. We don't, ha don't have a Bill of Rights or constitutional rights, we have what they call um, the, the, the um, con uh, contractual rights, it's kind of the treaties of the European Union, it's the effect of the Constitution, we're just not allowed to call it a Constitution. Um, so, what happened with all of that? Um, once the first deal, which was called Safe Harbor, was dead, um, the Commission came around, the European Commission, two or three months later, with this wonderful logo and said, oh, there's a new deal. It's called the EU-US Privacy Shield. And I was like, which graphics person ever? <laughs> Anyways. Um, and um, what was interesting was presented in the European Parliament, and I asked one of the people at the Commission, you know, how did they end up with this shitty name? And the answer of the guy at the Commission was like, I've never heard that name before. It's basically something that the Commissioner made up and the PR people. This deal doesn't even exist right now. So they presented a wonderful deal to the public that didn't actually exist. I don't have it in the slides right now, but we kind of two weeks later made a freedom of information request in the US. Um, a, a, a colleague organization did that, and they asked for the text of the New Deal that was presented in press conferences and so on. And the answer they got was that the access request is rejected because the record you requested does not exist. <laughs> they literally presented a deal that simply didn't exist at the time. Two months later, there was actually then the text of the deal, and, and we could actually read it. Now, what was really interesting is the European Commission put a lot of PR effort into that. And they, for example, said that the US authorities assured that there's no indiscriminate or mass surveillance by national security authorities. That was in all the newspapers then. We now have these wonderful assurances. Now, as a lawyer, you tend to kind of read text in very much in detail and word by word. And I was like, assured. So basically, they just told us that they don't do it. And that's kind of like China assured us that there is no secret concentration camps. <laughs> Great, thanks for the assurance. And then the second is like indiscriminate or mass surveillance. That term doesn't have a trademark or a definition. So once you go into the actual deal, you see how this all works out. So there's an annex to this um, European Commission decision. And on page four of this annex, you find that there is collection in bulk. So we don't have master indiscriminate surveillance, but we have bulk collection. Um, and that is used for six purposes that go as far as combating transnational criminal threats. And again, reading text in detail, you don't need a crime, you need a threat. So if there is some Mexican dude walking along the border with a little bit of cocaine or whatever in his hand, that's a threat because if he puts it through the border fence, that's a transnational crime because you basically just trafficked drugs. That's technically enough for a bug collection. And if you then go through the exact details of all of that, you realize how the press release is very different if you actually then go into it. Now, if you go not just in what the EU published, but actually the source document in the US, that word bulk has a little footnote. And if you follow that footnote, you, follow that this, you realize that these limitations only apply if um, the data is actually processed in bulk in long term. If you collect all the data in bulk to then find the needle in the haystack, this is not bulk collection. This is um, basically um, targeted collection for the definition of all of that. So if you go from press release layer to layer to layer, you realize actually we have all mass surveillance, um, but we have assurances that there isn't any. And that is basically how the system works. We even, as the evidence that they produced for the court, they said, oh, we have a letter by the US, they don't do it. So that's the evidence we have as the European Commission. And it's to me mind blowing because, I mean, it's like Russia saying, oh, we never invaded anybody. Here's a letter and Russia told us, so what's the problem? <laughs> and, and that is a bit how technically all of this went down. Um, there was also an issue that you couldn't go to any court in the US, um, and they came up with a wonderful solution, that there is now a privacy shield ombudsperson. It was that person at the time. And the system was that you would go to your local data protection authority in the EU, they would forward the issue to that person, they would then internally in the US try to figure out the problem and give you an answer. And the wonderful thing is the deal already had the answer pre-described. Like literally the deal said what you're going to get as an answer in any case. And they would always tell you that the case has been investigated, duh, otherwise you wouldn't get an answer. Second, that they either complied or remedied the situation, but they don't tell you which one. 
So either they complied from the get-go or they didn't comply, but they remedied the situation. There is no answer that they didn't remedy the situation. Not possible. They always remedy the situation. And then they would al also tell you that they neither confirm nor deny that there was any surveillance on you. And the reason for that is if they would actually tell you there was surveillance on you, you would actually have a possibility to get into U American courts because in the US there's a stand-in doctrine and it's really hard to get into courts for litigation. Uh, the ACLU that we work with, which is kind of the fundamental rights organization in the US, actually litigated the uh, US government and they, the US government says you cannot prove that you were actually under surveillance because of all the different hubs and networks we surveil. There's always one or two that is down. And your package could have gone through the one that is actually down. So they started litigation, I kid you not, with Wikimedia um, to say that's Wikipedia, that's one of the most visited web pages ever. And the US government still argued it could be that all Wikipedia packages of the last years always went through that one hub and therefore we never captured it. That was the one that actually the courts did not accept anymore. Um, but for anybody else, they basically say, oh, you can prove you were actually under surveillance. Um, and if they would have basically told you there, then you would have a cause of action. Um, so, the, this deal was also struck down by the Court of Justice in our second litigation. What are the practical consequences and reality is that all these kind of transfer deals that are not necessary were actually under threat. There is no legal basis to do that anymore. Um, if you divide it up, it basically means if you, I don't know, book a hotel or a flight in the US, that's fine, that's necessary, no problem. There was a lot of the industry uh, streaming, oh, the world is going to go under, you can't send emails to the US anymore, which was utter bullshit, but it works for just creating drama. Um, what is a problem is if you outsource your data to an electronic communication service provider in the US. Um, and that also includes servers in the EU. So what these big companies said is, oh, we have a, a server in Frankfurt, wonderful. What they did not say is that these American laws do not have a jurisdictional limitation. So they basically apply globally to any server that they have access to, which is normal, same thing in Austria for um, investigative powers, wherever you have access as, a, as an authority you can get there. The limits in the US is what they so, call possession custody control. So if an American provider can say, I cannot physically access the data, I simply don't have the keys, I gave it to someone else in Europe, then they would be out. And that would be a possibility that they have a sub um, organization in the EU that holds the data and the American boss simply doesn't have access to it. That would work. Um, but when you talk to the big tech companies, they're like, oh, that costs money, it's complicated. Um, so that didn't really happen in reality. Um, you can still transfer data, as I said, to a normal company in the US that is not an electronic communication service provider. Now, we basically filed complaints against the biggest websites of the European Union and basically country by country to actually try to enforce this uh, second judgment. Um, and it ended up to be 101 complaints. We basically went through Google Analytics and Facebook Pixel just because it was easy to find and easy to, to show um, and went through public www to find them. And because it happened to be 101, we already had our logo there as well. Um, and what was interesting is we basically, when we went through the companies, most of them said, sorry, we removed it, blah, 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 because it was just a Facebook pixel and it didn't really, was easy enough to, to remove usually. The second thing is that they said they did supplementary measures, which is basically what was discussed the last couple of years as the big solution. And then there is a, what they call risk-based approach to just quickly debunk why that is all bullshit. Um, so the supplementary measures. There was the idea, and it was actually in our submission to the Court of Justice, we were the only ones to argue for that, that you could find a technical solution for the problem. And we were like, if you find a technical solution, be my guest, wonderful, great. Um, one of the arguments for that was, okay, if you transfer data, let's say to, I don't know, Australia, it may go through 100 countries on the way that we really don't trust. And if that is end-to-end -end encrypted, fair enough, we could probably work with that and, and, and say that's fine. Same thing is it goes just through the US and just goes somewhere else and you may have proper encryption and technical solutions for that. Now, what the industry made out of that is that they basically said, oh, we have technical stuff like encryption in transit and, and you can encrypt backups. But if you boil down to like a zero knowledge approach, you're almost at no useful scenarios anymore where you can actually use that. What the industry then started to say, oh, we're just going to have contractual stuff. Contractual is wonderful because you just taste, change some text in the terms and conditions and never touch anything anymore and not solve any of the problems. And they basically say that they will inform you or resist or try to kind of do anything against surveillance like that. Problem is not working if the third country law like in the US doesn't allow that. So the US already says there is a gag order, you're not allowed to talk about the surveillance, all of that is in secret, blah, blah, blah. So they, they produced pages and pages of text saying, oh, if possible, we will inform you. It's like, if possible means it's not possible, so you're not gonna do that. And what we saw is that these big tech companies just generated 30 pages, 40 pages of bullshit, 
of all the wonderful supplementary measures that they do, and they were literally laughable. Like some of them are on website, you can go through them. There's just nothing that actually from a realistic perspective helps anybody. Um, so we went, um, that's the EDBB that basically confirmed that. Facebook was super interesting. They had stuff like, we have a tech team or a legal team that actually reviews requests. I was like, I guess so. I mean, if the police asked for data, it would be nice if someone reused that. But the law is still you have to give it. So what's, what's the point in having that team? Um, my favorite one was actually Google. They said that they put out the fence around their data center and put a sign on it that they shouldn't enter. That was one of the, on the list of their supplementary measures. I was like, yeah, I'm sure the NSA is going to be super impressed about that. Um, there was um, a lot of these supplementary measures went around. Um, all the authorities in Europe usually told the companies to fuck off with that. Um, but a lot of the big tech deciders or the people that you know then buy big products are like, oh, there's a long list of, meta of um, Microsoft, for example, that tell us everything's fine, so let's just continue as it is. And that was kind of what this, it was a PR exercise largely. And then the, the funniest one was the so-called risk-based approach. That is something that the lawyers pulled out of their ass. Um, it's basically that in the GDPR, there are certain elements where there, there is a risk element, where the law says, dependent on the risk, you have to do X. Typical thing is security. There is never perfect security, but dependent on your risk, what you have, blah, 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 technical developments, you have to do what's kind of state of the art usually. Now they said, oh, we found that in three articles or four articles of the GDPR. Let's say that's a general principle of the law and we just apply risk to everything in the whole law, which is just not how law works at all. But that was actually um, put around and, and argued by a lot of the lawyers to say, oh, we should write you a piece of paper as the CEO of a company that everything is legal because we now apply a risk-based approach. It's like we apply a risk-based approach to murder. Um, murder just doesn't exist because it's risk-based. Um, that's kind of the, the thinking behind it. That was also rejected by first the Austrian authorities authorities now by a couple of other courts. Now, um, back to enforcement, we tried to kind of get this through. As I said, we made these 101 complaints, was super slow. Most of the DPAs didn't really want to do anything about it because most of the data protection authorities are like, oh, data transfers, don't touch it, problematic, we don't want to kill the internet. Um, there were some cases like in Germany or France where public tenure was a problem, so that basically for government um, uh, for government um, projects, they couldn't use Microsoft anymore because they couldn't comply with the law. What's really interesting, what's upcoming is non-material damages. So theoretically, um, the EU passed a collective redress directive this summer where you can do collective redress, meaning Sammerklagen, like where a th thousands or millions of people can get together and bring a case. Um, and that be could become interesting if uh, we also have non-material damages. So let's say each person whose data was transferred to a country that um, you don't like where your data goes to asks for 100 euros. If you then have, let's say, I think Facebook has 200 million users. If you do the math, that becomes really, really interesting. Um, this is starting now, so we're just um, seeing where that goes down and, and if there could be more cases in that direction because that will allow people to directly do something and not depend on the authorities to do something. So that's kind of on the enforcement side what's up. So, um, then after all this drama and the last couple of years, the commission came around and presented another wonderful deal. The third now, so first we had Safe Harbor, now we have Privacy Shield, now it's a transatlantic data privacy framework. Um, the cool kids call it TATP, apparently. That's now what's all over Twitter. Um, and the story of that was there was basically one and a half years of negotiations. The European Commission said, no deal, the Americans don't move, how should we ever solve the problem? And then these two guys got together over a coffee and suddenly solved all the legal problems in a heartbeat. And the background was that after the invasion of Ukraine, the US literally apparently, what I was told, um, was coming up the next day and said, we now need to show everybody that we love each other. And how better to show each other that we love each other than having a wonderful conference or a press conference where that dude says you can get natural gas from the US and that person says you can get our data and that seems to have been the political logic of the new deal um, same thing again there was no text there was only headlines same procedure as last time and what was interesting is that um, they basically then produced a paper about a year later and what they do is just spam everybody with tons of paper and I talk to lawyers that give presentations and explain that this is not a wonderful new deal and everything's fine. 
no one the fuck has read these papers. None of these lawyers that sit there that I've talked to has ever read that shit in detail. Now, um, I'm the unlucky person that actually reads stuff in detail. <laughs> um, so if you go through it, uh, basically what they do is that they have these um, commercial principles. So the commercial principles tell you what the companies can do with the data. And these principles are still the old safe harbor and privacy shield principles, now top principles. Um, that still be, are based on the privacy laws we had in the 1990s in Europe. So not GDPR, the old directive. And the interesting thing is they updated them. Now, an uh, industry organization in the US has shown the updates. So on the core principles, they added the US twice in here, and the footnote on the first two pages. Second and third page, no change at all. And the last page, they added that there could be other enforcement than the other two, uh, than the authorities that right now exist. They are not foreseen. It's just like an option to do that in the future. That's the big upgrade to the new core principles. <laughs> now, if you compare these core principles with the GDPR, in the EU, you usually need consent or another legal basis. There are six different legal bases. In the American system, you only need to have an opt out if you share the data with someone else or if you change the purpose of the processing. Now, here, basically, they have to ask you, for example, for a consent and say, do you want that or not? In the US system, that's usually a sub, sub, sub process. So someone far down chain and down in the processing chain, some company that you've never heard, you just know kind of the front, the front page of something and they have, I don't know, 20 companies in the background that do some shit. This sub, sub, sub company has to offer an opt out on their website for these two purposes. No one in the world ever knows that their data goes to that company. No one ever checks that. No one ever goes to the website and then clicks the opt-out. So basically what that means is you can do whatever the fuck you want to do with data and still be certified as fully compliant with EU law. Which is amazing because even on the commercial side, we allow these companies to do much more with data than our own companies are allowed to do um, under this new deal. Um, same thing is usually we need data to be necessary. There it only has to be relevant, which is a legal difference, but it basically means as long as there is some relevance for what you're doing, you can use the data. Necessary really needs you absolutely need the data, which allows you suddenly to kind of store as double the, the amount that you would be allowed to store otherwise. Typically in the EU, you have full access. You would get access to all your data. There is very limited access to all of that. And dot, 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 there's a hundred other of these comparisons that you can look into where these two deals are just very different. Now, um, on the government surveillance side, there is now a new executive order. Um, quickly, what is an executive order? We all know that Trump had his wonderful Sharpie and put stuff up in the cameras and said, oh, I signed something. That is an executive order. Um, and an executive order is an internal, um, um, an internal um, rule by the government that is not a law. So it's like your boss telling you, do A, not B. That's not a law. Your customers cannot sue you over it. No one else can sue you. It's an internal order. And that is the same thing with an executive order. So they have rules on saying, do this on surveillance, don't do the other on surveillance. But if they break it as a person that, whose data got illegally surveilled, you have no right to actually go against it. It's basically, yeah, your boss said something, you didn't do it, but that's an internal problem, nothing that you can rely on. And that is an executive order. The reason why the US uses that a lot now is because their political system is very broken. They can't even pass the budget anymore. So it's very hard to pass any laws. So they try to kind of manage the whole country with these executive orders. But for the purposes of surveillance, not really helpful because you don't have any rights under it. Now, um, they said, oh, there's this wonderful new executive order that is now signed by Biden. What they did not say is, the new executive order is 14086, that actually there was a PPD 28, which is also an executive order from Obama, that literally had the same shit in it. Now, the commission runs around again saying, oh, there is this executive order with all these limitations, and it's all wonderful and all great and all new. The reality is you find almost all these limitations in the old PPD 28. That was already at the Court of Justice, and the Court of Justice already said that's not enough. So it's reformulated, same shit and we run it through the court another time around. There are some differences. Um, so the, there's largely the same limitations. There's slightly clearer languages in the, in the new executive order. Um, but there's, for example, also additional reasons for mass surveillance. So for example, for a health crisis, that's what they added after Corona, or for climate change. So they can now, I, don't, I have no fucking clue what, how they surveil people and then help climate change. I don't know, but maybe everybody found on the left found that cool. I don't know, um, but <laughs> that's now in. Um, so it's not that there is more protections. There's also parts where there's actually more surveillance in it. And the commission usually wants around and say, oh, it's wonderful and it's better. It's, I think, generally a bit in the right direction. But it's like if the Court of Justice said put up a fence and the fence is now 
two millimeters instead of one millimeter, yeah, it's higher, <laughs> but it doesn't really fend off anybody. Um, and that is kind of what they did. What was really interesting is they now added the word proportionate to US law. And that would be a huge game changer. And that was the main thing that they put out in the press releases. And the problem with that is the following. And unfortunately, we had to convert the um, presentation so you don't see the full effect of this. Imagine the lower thing is not there for theatric reasons. Um, what they basically said in, America in the European system is that FISA and PRISM surveillance is a violation of the essence of your fundamental rights. So it's not even proportionate. At the same time, the US says to continue this violation, uh, this, these, this um, processing of data, this surveillance, not going to change any of it, but it's also now going to be proportionate. And this you cannot square. Like this is technically not able to, you cannot technically square it. And the solution that they did is that they basically just said there is an American definition of proportionality, which is just going to be shifted so far over that we can agree on the word, we both agree on the word proportionality, but then the definition is going to be different. This is now the latest solution to the problem. Um, and it works well because the European Commission can say, oh, they now have a proportionate surveillance system. And the US can say, yeah, sure, proportionate, but just our proportionate. So everybody can walk off and everybody can be happily ever after. And we can go back to the Court of Justice with that slide. And the judges are probably going to be like, in which fucking film am I in? Um, but that is basically what, what they're doing. Now, then they were unhappy, the Court of Justice, about this um, ombudsperson. And I actually brought some stuff for you here. I usually forget to bring it. Um, they basically now replaced the ombudsperson with a CLPO. I forgot what the acronym is for. Um, but it's basically another dude that does the same thing. There should be now an animation that we don't have. Um, and gives you exactly the same answer. And the funny thing is, as with the old answer, it's exactly the same one that I mentioned before. You can get that back. Now, if you're unhappy with that, you can go to the court, which is a second instance. It's not a real court. Um, it is actually also an executive body that they just called court. Um, and it's amazing because the US has a definition of what a court is, and you need a law to establish a court. It's not a court. It's what you can call an independent tribunal, something like that. But the EU insisted it has to be called court. So this thing now got a new name. It's now a court. But it does exactly the same exercise that you had before a second time around. And you will get exactly the same answer a second time around. But therefore, you have an appeal. And someone asked, How, what are you going to write in your appeal? Because in the first instance, this system here, you don't know anything why you got that answer. You never heard. You have no reason to say this decision is wrong because you were absolutely excluded from the procedure. You just filed something with your DPA and five months later you get this or ten months later. And they said, oh, if you appeal, you don't have to argue your appeal. You just have to write, I appeal, because you cannot argue your appeal because you don't know anything about the procedure. So it's the most puppet thing the world has ever seen. Um, and because we thought it's funny, um, we basically took that exact wording and put it on a stamp so if you want to have your judgment anytime soon, you can get the stamps here. You can have the first instance and the second instance. This is your judicial um, approval and your um, kind of judicial redress. Anybody that wants stamps here, the lawyers love it. I don't know if the tech people love it that much, but um, the lawyers find this the most amazing thing ever. Um, OK, and then there's a lot of technical shit with all of that. Um, for example, this whole new deal only applies for data that was transferred from the EU to the US under one of these deals after July of this year. Now, that means if you process data or transfer data before that date, you would actually have to get it back to the European Union and then send it to the US a second time around to actually even fall under the definition of the time application of this whole deal. So technically, I don't know, my Facebook or Instagram data would have to be removed back to the EU, then sent back to the US so that you fall under the definition of this executive order. Because the executive order does not apply to anything that happened before um, this summer. Um, so a lot of that stuff is, is in reality just laughable and really doesn't, I mean, you just wonder how you can ever get there. Now, um, What's the short-term solution? My problem is usually with Noib, we do a lot. We have more than 800 cases, and usually we explain to people that's how you fix the privacy problem, and, and everything is fine. Here, it's a political problem. We don't have a fix for it. We can't change US law. We can't change European law. Um, but if we think about solutions a little bit, um, the short term is this is going to be ping pong, get back to the court of justice and probably be destroyed again in two years, and then we are back at square one, and we do the whole exercise another time around. Long term, um, what could be the solutions? So I think what we need to talk about in the long run, and there is a part of the executive order that has that in it, is kind of what they call a no-spy agreement. 
So if we now have a globalized internet and each country only protects their own people, your data is typically not protected 99% of the time when it's somewhere not in your own country, which is typically where your data is in, in most of, 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 of um, the situations that we have today. So one option is that at least among the democratic countries in the world, we come around with a kind of no spy agreement where we say, okay, we have baseline guarantees, they're all the same and it's independent of citizenship. Would be very logical. And actually the executive order has an element of that in it because it says it only applies to the EU if the EU also gives these rights to Americans. Which, fair enough, I mean, I think that's a fair proposition, but if you do that both ways, at a certain point you would end up at a no-spy situation where basically countries grant these rights to each other, and that could allow data transfers again. The reality is right now in the US that's politically almost impossible. If you talk with anybody in, in Washington, they say, if I grant rights to foreigners, I get voted out of office. I get voted into office if I take away rights from foreigners, <laughs> that's how politics works. Um, so this could only work if the industry is really pushing for it, to say, okay, if we need to process data and we need to do our shit, we need to solve this legal problem here, and that is basically how um, such an agreement could come around. Let's say in 20 years, I think that could be an option. Now, this, the cheapest option would be that the US would just put 20 judges there. Then we wouldn't have to worry about all that stuff. We didn't need, wouldn't have to pay lawyers for all this kind of crazy stuff. But that's, as I said, politically also unlikely to happen. In the meantime, what's going to happen more, I guess, is that we have the segregation, where basically data is just held in the European Union, and we have some data holder here that is not um, directly accessible from the US. Not a big fan of that. I'm personally more of a globalist, where you know we just should have free data flows and proper regulations. But for the time being, that's probably what we're going to see more um, for companies that actually want to comply with all of that. So not the perfect solution, but at least the in-between solution. And we will see um, last sentence on that. Um, that much more because right now this is a conflict of law debate about privacy, but we will have similar conflict of law debates in other areas. Typical example is freedom of speech. In, in Austria and Germany, um, or also in France, the denial of the Holocaust is a crime. That's not going to change anytime soon. <laughs> um, in the US, that's freedom of speech. How, as a company, do you comply with the both rules at the same time? So you will have more and more and more of that because the different countries try to regulate the internet more. We see new laws passed every year on the internet, and there is no jurisdictional rules on that. So we will see these conflicts. We're probably the first ones here with the privacy debate, but we will see similar conflicts in many other areas of the law. So we will have more and more of a discussion of which jurisdiction is your data in, what is the one that you want to comply with or not, and you will not be able to comply with 200 because... I mean, you probably don't want to comply with certain rules of this, kind of this world. Um, so I hope that was useful. Um, I know it was a bit deep dive uh, legal stuff, but it may be useful to get a bit of a background of, of these issues. And thanks a lot. And I think we have some time for discussion now as well. And I was told um, they need a couple of minutes to put chairs up and so on. So for the time that we need for that, if you have any questions, we can do that right now, as I understood. Thanks. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thanks a lot. And if anybody's interested here, <laughs> I had it at some legal conference. I mean, lawyers are usually very dull, and, and I'm the one person not wearing like a suit. Um, but they then came up with like all these stems, like as if they have been on a club or something. That was really amazing. <laughs> well. Thank you very much. That was super enlightening, I would say, especially I'm from Canada. As a North American, we kind of look at EU privacy laws, uh, I think, kind of as a target, and yeah. yet <laughs> there are a few issues out yeah. there. Uh, one question I have while we're collecting questions from the audience, um, given that you're an expert in EU law as it relates to US law, I'm curious how you feel about you know, that's not even solved yet. You've been working on it for quite a long time. Yet we have, you know, more than a few countries. There are countries all over the world. So how do you see these efforts that you're doing, especially with Noi, um, maybe being an example for other countries in the world? And how do we deal with all the permutations? Yeah, so a um, couple of questions there at the same time. So we have a huge enforcement issue in the European Union. Um, and that's especially with the data protection authorities. And for, as a lawyer, it's a weird bubble you're in. Like typically if someone parks in the wrong spot, they get a ticket goodbye. If you are in a legal bubble for GDPR, you're at conferences where like, yeah, you know, it would be really interesting if we would do something about that. And I, I literally had that with a, with a head of a DPA that told me, oh, wouldn't it be funny if we would actually enforce all of that over dinner? And I was like, 
that's like the drug police say, oh, wouldn't it be funny if we would do something about fucking crack? <laughs> and, and this is like a bubble where even as a lawyer, you're sometimes wondering which one, which bubble you're in. Um, so that's, I think, the first part. Secondly, what we see is uh, we have, I think, about 70 countries globally that follow more or less the European system, Canada being one of them. Um, so even the US is kind of squeezed in, like Mexico is basically following a similar GDPR type of law. Canada does. Canada also has an adequacy decision for that. Um, so we, I think in the long run, this typical system that we have is going to spread out in more countries globally and will become the standard. What's going to be a huge problem is divergence. Different countries, different laws. Biggest issue right now, the US itself, because the 50 different states started to have privacy laws. So there is now a um, privacy law in, I think, um, Illinois for um, biometrics, but only for biometrics. Then there is one for that. And, and this is going to be unmanageable at some point. So we will at some point have to come to an international consensus on how we do deal with that. And the, de facto, I think the European system is very logical, structured, um, and more or less a system that is similar to that would probably work in the long run. However, each country is free to decide what they do. Um, so that will be interesting how all of that moves along and how that interconnects. And I think what's really important is to have a, a systematic approach because this is technically not feasible. You can't comply, like write code for 50 different jurisdictions and still keep that separate and follow all of these rules. It's just, uh, I think for, for economic reasons, not really. Uh, sensible. Um, and the biggest issue then is that we actually, I should move over to get this, okay, yeah. Um, and the biggest issue is that we also get that enforced in the end, because that's our big concern in Europe, like five years after the GDPR, they now started having a couple of bigger fines, and the DPA has basically put out one big fine every two or three months to say, oh, we did something, look at it. Uh, but in our case, we have more than 800 cases, and at certain jurisdictions, 99% of the complaints are simply not dealt with. So you have a fundamental right to privacy. You claim it, and then 99% of the time they tell you, ah, not for you. And I sometimes joke it's like a right to, to vote, but 99% of the time there's no voting booth. Then you don't really have a right to vote. <laughs> and, and that is where, where we see that the culture hasn't changed with the GDPR. So the legislator said big fines, big enforcement, heavy serious. Um, that was more than 90% in the European Parliament. So it's interesting because of very strong political backing. All the member states voted for it, other than Austria, my home country, because we thought it's not strict enough for whatever reason. Um, but everybody backed it, but now the executive is simply not enforcing it. And that is, that is an interesting political situation where democracy doesn't work that well anymore <laughs> if there's a political cons consensus and then the authorities just don't do it. I hope that's somehow useful. I we now got the chairs. <laughs> I know, it's amazing. Choose your favorite. Uh, do we have any audience questions? Does anybody have, uh, do we have a microphone that we can, yeah? Sure, yes. Wonderful. Hi. Uh, you spoke on the separation between data of U.S. citizens and non-U.S. citizens. How does that work if that data is mixed? So let's say I have a conversation with a friend that is a U.S. citizen. Yeah. Is the NSA allowed to listen to half the no. conversation? Um, so basically, whenever there is any American involved, it kind of falls under all of these rules. There was litigation on that because they were technically partly not able to properly do that. Uh. <laughs> and that is then litigated in the U.S. So if it's like, oh, this tiny little bit of an American conversation was in the system, that's a case. Um, other people in the system, not a case, because you don't have rights under the Fourth Amendment. All right, thank you. Yeah. So, if I remember correctly, the GDPR says that you should not collect more data than absolutely necessary to fulfill the, the purpose. Yeah. purpose. Now, I'm wondering, with Sam Altman, I think some people know about him, and he's really big in this new thing called World App where you can create like an authentication system called proof of personhood. So you only sign up and then you know your person. But why do all these platforms need to know that I am me, actually? And yeah. this would be like the lowest level of actual necessary data. Yeah. Why, why go anywhere beyond that? And typically, you can litigate that if you have cases like that. The other concept that goes in is privacy by design, is kind of to already build a system to have minimum information. I had a very simplified, again, I'm not a tech person. I had four years of programming in high school where, as a lawyer, I'm already very cool. Um, but um, the, uh, there are situations like that that we, for example, have with, in Austria, at least with EID, which is its own issue. Uh, but for example, it allows to show that you're above 18 or not. 
if a company needs to know you're above 18 because you buy tobacco or whatever, they don't need to know your ID, your name, your birth date, and so on. They just need to know above 18 or not. And that can be solutions where that technically is doable, and that can also be litigated because you have to ask why is the system designed to give, I don't know, 20 fields if you only just need a binary yes or no. And, and that would be the proper design then. So I could sue the company for you collecting more data than you actually Typically need? Typically you could if, if you have a good case on that and you have to, have to show that in the individual case that was not necessary. How easy is that? Um, not overly easy. Um, to give you an example, the litigation, the Schrems 2 litigation in Ireland cost 10 million euros. What? And I was personally liable um, if I would have lost. <laughs> so, um, what? The, the next thing I checked is there is no enforcement agreement between Ireland and Austria, so I was like, I'm just not going to have a summer house, I guess. Um, but that's the reality that also the, um, the, 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 the court system and the political system and, and all of that in certain member states is extremely shitty. Um, in Ireland, to bring a case generally, you have to calculate about 100,000 euros. Um, and uh, we got from winning it 1.3 million back for our legal fees because the whole legal system is so slow and so convoluted and complicated um, that you just need a lot of hours by lawyers to kind of be put in. To give you an example, in Austria, an appeal costs 30 euros. And so you have like extreme differences. And that's to a large extent what we do at, at Neub is to try to find these differences and use them because they basically go to Ireland because they know it's almost impossible to litigate. They know they don't pay taxes there. So they basically choose a jurisdiction as a company. They're like, we can choose a jurisdiction as citizens. Let's bring it in a country where stuff actually works. And that is also possible the other way around. So that's what we call strategic litigation. It's very complicated and especially in the EU it's very complicated because you have all the different languages, legal systems and so on. It's immense and we're just scratching the surface but there's a lot of efficiency in it because we run on donations like everything we do is, is donated money um, and I have the feeling if someone donates us money that I'd rather put it somewhere where I get a lot from 30 euros than very little from 100,000. Um, but that's basically uh, its own story. I could do a whole day on that. <laughs> Now, I think we'll take one more question, but we do have to set up for the panel discussion, and I think these topics will really just continue during that discussion. So I think we'll bring the mic over here. Hi, uh, Max. Uh, first of all, thanks for everything you did for us. That's really absolutely fantastic. Um, I'm also in the... In the <clears throat> I'm also a certified board commissioner of the, in the German um, Association of Data, uh, Data Protection Commissioners uh, in the working in the healthcare area. What, what you just said triggered something in me. Well, actually what you said, uh, the US authorities are not allowed to spy on US citizens. So coming from a legal point of view, wouldn't it be just simply the solution to add one US citizen to your database <laughs> and uh, then sue them in the US? <laughs> um, that's exactly where these tar target minimization procedures come in. So they have to have a uh -huh. procedure to separate them in the database or in the data stream in reality. Yeah. Um, and that is partly why the system works. They have thought about that. Oh, damn. That's the whole okay. part of this damn. thing that they have to get certified <laughs> to show to the court that they do exactly this thing right. All right. Um, not, not much more, but that's the one thing that has to work. Damn. <laughs> <laughs> but nice try. <laughs> Thanks.